Okay, sounds good. Uh, my name's Matt. I uh, put this talk together because I, uh, so basically, I guess, you know, brief who is real quick. Uh, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. I've been doing computers for a long time. Uh, I love it. And uh, lately, the big thing I've been working on are bug bounties. Um, and that kind of actually got me uh, into this. So uh, basically, TLDR on this is a network-based unauthenticated memory disclosure on a SIP phone. And um, I basically played with it and it found uh, just some pretty interesting things that you can pull out of it. Uh, and I'm going to show you here. It, it's uh, worked out pretty cool. The backstory actually goes back to basically DerbyCon uh, 2019. Um, I, so, you know, that was the last DerbyCon course in being from Louisville. Naturally, I was made sure I was there. Um, and, you know, they always have a lineup of awesome speakers. Uh, but so the first, I guess it must have been Saturday, I was uh, on my way to the first talk of the day, and I saw this sign over here uh, across the way, and I, you know, basically was, like, drawn to that thing, like uh, a bug is drawn to uh, a zapper or something. And... Uh, so I walked in there and literally did not leave for the rest of the day. And um, it was so cool. You know, we work on this stuff all the time and, and hear about the vulnerabilities and deal with them. Uh, but to, to see all the different stuff laid out there from basically, you know, NASs to uh, routers to light bulbs really uh, struck a chord with me, I guess. So, I think in that sense, um, uh, ILT Village really achieved what they were shooting for. Um, so basically that, uh, so that would have been in September of last year. And uh, I kind of walked away from that with, a, with the notion that I wanted to spend some time uh, in the next year hacking on that stuff, coming up with my own, basically, you know, old days. Uh, and um, so about a month later, I was uh, working on a bug bounty and uh, had an interesting scope because it was basically like all IPs, which, you know, normally it's like hosts and stuff. Uh, and so I thought I would um, do some recon, you know, follow all the steps, right? passive recon first. And so I, I started with Shodan, uh, mostly just to get familiar with it because I hadn't really used it very much. And actually I think I had done it wrong because I didn't end up at the target that I thought I was wanting to end up at, but I basically ended up just browsing through Shodan for a few hours. And, um, like, you know, I, I never was one to like sit there and watch cat videos for hours. Uh, but, once I came across Shodan and all the cool stuff that you can find on there, uh, it's basically like my cat videos, I guess. And, uh, and so basically as I'm browsing through here, I, um, let me pull up a better picture here. I'm, uh, Scrolling down and uh, go ahead. Let's go back. Uh, yeah, I guess I. Uh, let's do well. Not that one. I'm, I imagine you guys probably can't see that very well. So I'm working on uh, how I can make that look better. Give me just one second.
Okay. There we go. That's what I was shooting for. Actually that. Okay. So uh, I'm browsing on the show day and I come across this. Obviously, I have a bunch of stuff marked out right now, so I apologize for that. Uh, but, you know, nothing too crazy here. Uh, and then I keep scrolling down. Okay. And basically come to this. So clearly what's happened here is, uh, you know, the Shodan server is uh, hitting this web server uh, that's running on a phone over and over, 401. And then uh, basically, so they've implemented uh, some security controls, like, you know, basically password lockout. And, uh, and then it literally just pukes its guts up on you. Uh, it's like, oh, you failed your password. And uh, here you go. So, you know, the first time I looked at this, I actually didn't see anything too interesting. Uh, you know, obviously that's memory. I recognize that pretty quickly. Um, but, it, you know, I didn't really see a whole lot of impact initially. Uh, and then so I basically monitored it for a few days. And, uh, and started to see like some SIP traffic come across. And uh, so basically I looked for other devices of this make and model and there were actually only like two or three on the internet. And, uh, and they didn't always produce this uh, output when they, uh, when you hit the 403. So it's kind of like on that particular day, I happened to just kind of stumble upon that particular device on the day that it was having a bad day. And uh, because I'm, you know, we work on this stuff and, and uh, you know, you're just kind of, I guess, keen to uh, what may be an indication of a bug and uh, followed up on it. And uh, it ended up being kind of cool. So, so I actually just, I actually watched that for probably, I don't know, a couple months and then uh, finally saw enough stuff coming across there that I decided, okay, you know, this is obviously a, a legit vulnerability, uh, but I want to confirm it first and also see like, what's the impact. Um, and so I went ahead and just bought one. Uh, probably not. Uh, you know, the most efficient way of doing it. Certainly, you know, I could have uh, tried to get the firmware and uh, and loaded it up on on Kimu or or Pi or something like that. Uh, but in this case, basically having it already basically worked out for me. Uh, it was just kind of a matter of, of uh, confirming. And so I uh, figured I'll go ahead and just buy the, buy the device. I actually ended up, so I got it. And, uh, you know, I mean, I've been working on this here and there for a few months at this point. Uh, and, and so like Amazon had dropped it off while I was at work and I came in and tore it open and, you know, so within an hour, basically, I've got the thing bricked, uh, you know, because I was thinking, well, let's make sure we have, like, the latest firmware on it uh, so we're not, like, reporting a vulnerability on some already patched software. And, uh, and yeah, that device basically never came back. Uh, and so that was a little bit discouraging, especially after, you know, spending, like, 150 bucks on it. Uh, but you know, I mean, that's, that's part of it, uh, occupational hazard, I guess. And part of the fun, of course, you know, I took it apart, uh, see what I could do and, and ribbon cables started breaking. And I was like, wow, okay, we'll revisit this. And, uh, so that's what I did. I waited probably, you know, a couple, few more months and, uh, and then finally 
decided, okay, well, I'll just order another one. And uh, fortunately, this one came with the latest firmware, so I didn't have to brick it. Uh, and within an hour of uh, opening that one, I had confirmed the bug. And uh, I actually did it through the browser. It was, I mean, as far as bugs go, super duper easy to find and, and, and uh, to some degree to reproduce. Uh, I mean, so basically like the first time I've powered it up, I opened up Chrome, failed to log in a few times, and then, and then we saw that. And, uh, <clears throat> so I quickly wrote it up, looked up like, Hey, does Mitel have a bug bounty program? That would be cool. No, they didn't. Um, but they did have a really good, uh, vulnerability disclosure presence, I guess. And, uh, and clearly, like, a, you know, they have a, a program and a team that's handling only those things. Uh, so, so that worked out good. Uh, so I basically reported it to them immediately. And uh, let's see, I don't, I don't want to get ahead of myself. So, And I'm not going to spend too much time on that because I'm going to show you in person. Uh, yeah, okay, we're on track here. So, uh, so... You know, as far as I was concerned, I reproduced it and I wrote it up, sent it off. And uh, and they were very, you know, prompt and professional. And within a few days, I had a response and like, hey, thanks. We'll look into it. And uh, a couple of few weeks went by and then they emailed me and like, hey, we can't reproduce this. And uh, so like, you know, for, for a bug bounty hunter, like not being able to reproduce your report is probably one of the worst possible things that could happen. And so I'm like, Oh man, you know, here I am just some schmuck on the internet, emailing these guys saying, Hey, your stuff's broken. They're like, no, it's not. Uh, so fortunately for me, I guess, uh, I was able to figure out what happened there. And as it turns out, like I never did get it to reproduce in a browser again. Uh, which kind of makes sense because it's basically just random memory and you never really know, like Chrome is not going to know what to do with a bunch of crazy stuff. Uh, and so like the first time I did it, it just happened to work in the browser. But basically every time after that, uh, I had to use like Netcat. But using Netcat or Telnet or whatever, it is uh, super duper reproducible. It's actually kind of impressive how much you can get from it. Um, so that was pretty cool. They do have a GPG key or PGP, I guess. Uh, so like, I probably did it the hard way, uh, but you know, I literally just use like GPG at the command line. So for, for someone who's used to reporting stuff, to companies through bounty program where they have basically like, you know, a website, it's HTTPS. They provide all the facilities for you to upload evidence and, and, and uh, tutorials and all that stuff. So major kudos to, to Mitel for, for basically, you know, being willing to hear and, and having the people and the resources dedicated to fixing these problems. Like, you know, that in and of itself is, is a huge thing. Uh, one of the takeaways for me, and not necessarily for me, but something that I would like to uh, help some of these companies appreciate is, uh, you know, the burden and really for them, the potential for human error. Because, you know, when you are like manually doing all that, you, even, even understanding asymmetric cryptography you know, I still had to take a second, like, okay, so I'm sending this to them. They need to be able to open it. So I got to encrypt it with their public key. You know, I got to generate a private key for, for their reply. Um, so that's just a lot of logistical stuff that I think a lot of people may not uh, have the patience or background for. And so, you know, that could, could have some, some pretty negative impacts if they basically just, uh, you know, if, if someone else reporting a bug failed to do that properly, and next thing you know, you're sending it over HTTPS, or plain HTTP, 
uh, you know, not really cool. So it ended up actually being, uh, you know, P1, I guess, in, in my terms. Um, so pretty interesting. Mytel is a CVE naming authority. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, PowerPoint, I think, corrected that for me again. So basically, uh, one of the things that was cool for me in this experience was learning the process for CVE. Um, and I actually had another uh, program, another bug through an actual bounty program pretty much simultaneously. And, um, and it was interesting because like there, that one was not a CNA, my tells a CNA. And so walking that path and understanding the different uh, roles and, and how you do it and uh, how you coordinate it, it's not very hard at all. And uh, my uh, miter basically has like a PowerPoint that walks you through everything. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of cool to go through the experience and, and understand it. Okay. So now we'll do some fun stuff. Okay. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Let's yeah, switch this off. My bad. I guess I'll put, maximize this window. There we go. We'll see how this goes, and if uh, I get too annoying on top of it, I will swap it. Okay, so basically I have, like, uh, have one of these phones right here. And uh, so, let me switch over here. Okay. So if we just, um, basically, okay. Plain old, as vanilla as you can get. HTTP request, write that to like a text line. And then uh, cap that. Pipe it to this on 40. Okay, 401 unauthorized. That's perfectly acceptable, normal, expected. We'll do that a few times. I don't remember exactly how many it is. Okay, probably about that many. Five something like that, which really, so like, you know, this came about, I always think it's interesting when you see like a uh, multiple level deep failure of code. Um, and so like this one is especially interesting because it's in an actual security control. And so like, I think there's really a lesson to be learned for, for all of us, you know, whether you're a penetration tester or, building a system or uh, uh, software developer or, you know, on like the IT security compliance side of things. You know, don't just check the box, push it a little bit because uh, no one would, would think to, to set up these particular circumstances to see what happens. But those are exactly the types of things that lead to some of the most impactful vulnerabilities. And, uh, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of really good resources on that. Um, like, so the other day I was like rewatching, I think, Sammy Kamkar's 2016 talk at AppSec Collie. And he basically 
it's just very interesting to listen to someone with his level of experience because he's explaining his thought process. And he's like, so I asked myself, what would happen if I did this? What, what, what if I did this? Could I make it do that? And, uh, and that's the kind of basically like structured, but creative and out of the box thinking that, that it takes to, to find impactful vulnerabilities and, uh, and not end up like with a whole bunch of duplicates and get frustrated with the whole process. Okay. So at this point I've basically locked out the account and it's locked out. Yeah. So, uh, so I've written a script here at this point, make it real easy. I guess I can let's see what that is. Oh, yeah. I've written a couple of scripts. Um, uh, okay. Some of that has to do with uh, being able to make it so people can call in. But uh, basically the key thing there, you can see, well, I guess you can see here, right? Uh, same thing I just did, but we're doing it 20 million times or something like that. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I think this is the number here. Okay, so I'm going to fire that off. And that should just basically start spilling its guts. Yeah, so it's ringing right here. Um, I mean, I have literally sacrificed one of these devices to the demo gods. So I fully expect that this is gonna work right off the bat. Uh, let's see. Obviously not. Okay. Um, so maybe that we have. Uh, look, let's just take another look at that real quick. Okay. Let's take a look here and see if I'm forgetting something. No, definitely. That should be the right thing. Okay. Sometimes, you know, like you like to totally mess up your, uh, your shell. So let me just reopen the new shell today. You know, this stuff wouldn't be fun if it worked immediately, I guess. Okay. We'll simplify it for a second. Oh my goodness. I'm such a doofus. I'm so sorry. It is literally doing exactly what it's supposed to. I'm apologize. Good grief. 
I forgot that I changed it up. Okay. So that is, uh, at this point, basically just uh, pushing to a file. And uh, let me open another window, and we're going to monitor that file. And, okay, so we will, this guy just created a script. It's going to sit there. Uh, so, just make sure I don't have anything weird going on. Okay. Um, okay, so if nothing is happening, it doesn't do anything. It just sits there and does nothing. So when I initially got it, uh, basically, how I confirmed it was just go in here and play with stuff. And it was kind of neat because I would start to see kind of going to do a bunch of stuff. Let's see, did I mess it up? I hit sail that thing. Yeah. Wow. That's an incredible amount of stuff. Okay. Yeah. So there we go. That's what I was expecting. Like literally the thing is just puking its guts up. And, uh, you know, it's kind of neat. So like, you know, I've seen CVEs come across. Like I subscribed to the RSE, RSS feed. And um, sometimes like memory disclosure can be tricky to – to exploit to actually get something valuable because it's you know a lot of times you don't have control over exactly which uh memory space you're going to get and so uh, one thing that's kind of neat about this is uh just how easy it is to get stuff it's kind of funny that's why i named this talk what i did because it's like basically other than me like breaking the device um Everything just like lined up, the stars aligned, and you know, at the end of the day, the world's a safer place. Uh, you know? So, one what I thought was really cool one time is I was sitting in here and I like changed the password. I'm in the admin portal, and uh, and I saw it right there. And I'm like, okay, well, there's secrets right there, and um, uh, one of my slides you can't really read it very well, but basically. Um, <clears throat> when you configure the SIP endpoint, uh, you have, you know, you have to give it credentials and, uh, I could see those in the dump as well. Okay. So at this point, what I'll do, so I've got a couple of numbers registered to this. Um, so what I'll do is since we've done a bunch of stuff, I'm going to reboot this phone and, uh, that basically will uh, ref basically like wipe its uh, RAM and uh, also let me get to the web interface to change its phone number. And while that's rebooting, I'll talk about a couple of things here. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so obviously there's not a whole lot of technical uh, 
chops being uh, put on display for finding this one. Let me kill this before it locks out this phone again. Cool. Uh, so, but there, but what this did do was presents a lot of opportunities uh, to for like, I guess lessons that I already knew, but kind of reinforced them, and some insights about things that I had not really thought about. And so, you know, there, we have all these sayings like, you know, packing stuff for fun and for profit, uh, and, and I've used that myself, and you know, it sounds cool, but I never really thought about it, the actual words and. Um, but it kind of hit me the other day. I was reading some, you know, something on Twitter or something, and basically people just like going off, and uh, you know, it just really struck me uh, that I think sometimes we need to step back and see where we're at, how we got here, and where we're going, and and really why we're doing what we're doing, um, because not that long ago. And even still today, you you know, a security researcher would find something like this and reach out to a company and either not get a response or get sued. And so for me to be able to just reach out to them and, and you know, basically just browse my way to a 10 and 9.8 CVSS bug on Shodan with com- absolutely no uh, intent uh, and then find the company and they have a, uh, a disclosure program. They want to hear about it. They're very friendly and professional and, uh, and then they fix it. And, uh, and it all just like went so swimmingly like that. That didn't just happen out of nowhere. Uh, there was a whole like industry wide I don't know what you want to call it, but, you know, issue 10 years ago, maybe not that long ago. And, uh, okay. Where like the whole question of vulnerability disclosure was a, a huge deal. And, and, and basically it got to the point where, where researchers are like, well, you know, we all love technology and we all want the technology that you're building. We all need it. I think like COVID, for example, just shows how important technology is to humankind at this point. And, you know, I mean, as bad as it's been, how much worse would it have been? Or would it be? It's still going on, obviously. Uh, you know, if, uh, if the people who are working from home couldn't work from home, that's not to minimize the impact that it has had, but just to say like, you know, I guess it, it could actually be worse. And, And so like these companies, you know, SIP phones, for example, I mean, that is a key driver to the ability to work from home and and have a distributed workforce. And so like we rely on not only these things working and not only them being secure, but like the people's trust in them. Like that's the worst possible thing that could happen is if people just stop trusting the Internet. Uh, That's going to be a problem. And it, no one is going to protect it or can protect it. So, like, it falls on this relatively tiny community. And uh, and so, yeah, I mean, we it's a very high-paying industry. And bug bounties, like, I was watching an a, a interview between Mayonnaise, I don't know his real name, and the Homsec the other day. And like, so he started doing bug bounties in late 2018 and has already made over a million dollars. I mean, that's amazing. But at the same time, it's important to uh, to understand where we came from and not get so caught up in that stuff that we're basically going off on Twitter because somebody didn't pay us as much as we thought they should pay us for a bug. And, and that doesn't help anybody. Um, so I think like sometimes you got to do it for fun and sometimes you do it for profit. In this case, I did it for fun. And, uh, you know, the other day I was basically just like, what else can I do with this? And I thought this might be kind of cool. So actually the biggest 
issue I had with it was my internet connection uh, is going through carrier grade NAT, so my public IP is not actually public. So getting the SIP traffic to me has been a debacle. Uh, but actually uh, applied something I picked up from the uh, so hopelessly broken lab I was doing like last year with, uh, you know, tunneling stuff through SSH. And so that's what I'm doing right now is basically UDP SIP traffic is hitting a, uh, Twilio and going to AWS through an SSH session that I created outbound and getting forwarded all the way to this phone. So uh, basically, Let me get a couple of things set up. What I was going to do is uh, I'll post a number. I've got like scripts and everything, it's just grepping stuff out to mask phone numbers and stuff. But uh, if you call and uh, you saw how fast that stuff's coming up here, it's grabbing uh, the phone numbers and uh, it's going to show the last four digits and I think like the first one or something. And so uh, if you Call this number I put up there, and your number shows up on this board over here somewhere. Uh, ping me after this, and uh, just tell me the remaining digits and your email address, and I'll send you a uh, Kindle, like a redemption code for a Kindle IoT Hacker's Handbook. Um, okay. So I'm going to turn that off for one second. I'm going to mute myself so you don't hear me like clacking these keys. And then uh, just get a couple things set up here and we'll be all set. Yeah, so I think I put this out there, but like only like the first five people can I do that for. Yeah. I'm not mayonnaise. Okay. So clean all that stuff. Okay. There we go. At least now, like, you see what I'm doing here. Nothing crazy. Okay, it's going to clear out this one. Okay. And clear that out. My bad. You ever have yourself like double muted on a meeting or something? I basically just did that to myself. I'm sitting here talking to you. My bad. Uh, okay. So I do have it all just basically ready to fire off.
because they wouldn't have died. that one? Well, that's actually the one we care about anyway, so let me just uh, find that off. So that should work for you. And then run this command here to update. Don't forget some people call. Um, and now let's let the command run. Okay, and if anybody is watching that window, they probably realized it's literally not doing anything. Um, but yeah, that's the wrong at this point. Here. But. that window so I don't dump people's phone numbers out if they don't want them to.
Okay, no, no más. It looks like we're close, we're at the time here, so Sam, I guess you just let me know if you want to uh, give me a stop. But basically, uh, we've got uh, Six. No, Matt, you're all good. If you, if you're, if you still want to sort of show anything off, I mean, like you're the last talk, so don't yeah, worry. I, mean, I got stuff I can keep going for a while. I mean, there's people there, and uh, and you got time. That's cool with me. Uh, so I do. I mean, I can see this person's called right now. So, uh, you know, I'm. I think I'm not in the Discord at this moment. I was having some problem with it. Uh, but just ping me. I'll hop on there as soon as we get off here and uh, give me your email address and I'll shoot that over to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 06275. Might be the only one. Let's see. That would explain. Seven seven zero two. So tonight, if these numbers are your phone numbers, you know, last portion of yours, ping me. So that what was that two um, nine three three one zero. It's kind of funny, just so like, because of the way I had to get that stuff working uh, through SSH tunnels, it's basically does not understand that you hung up. Okay, well, I'll, uh, that was three. I'll go through here and, uh, and, if there are two more unique ones, I will uh, post that. There's one right there, 25120. And actually, I was I thought this may happen if you are actually using like a SIP trunk that's not PSTN source. Uh, so, yeah. You know, I threw this together kind of uh, cheap and fast. Uh, and you know how they say, you can have things like uh, cheap, fast, and good, pick two. This is cheap and fast. So give me one second. If that's a legit source, we will want to get them.
Awesome. I hear you. I believe that's uh, anonymous at. So, I mean, if that is legitimately you, that's cool. Let me know. Um, okay. Six oh nine one eight. I think that's five. So uh if any of those rang a bell to you, then just ping me after this. Uh I'll send those codes over to you. And um uh, if that ends up being six, that's cool too. Okay. So let's switch real quick. Wrap up. But actually, it was a little bit, uh, I'm kind of glad it worked out like that, even though it was a little un, un, uh, unplanned. I was, you know, based on with my testing, I was a little afraid, like, five people will call just like that, and we wouldn't even be able to find them. So, okay. Um, so, I think I went through some of this already, most of this. Um, but, so, show Dan Dorking. And, uh, and there's someone mentioned a similar service to me the other day and I can't remember it. Uh, but a lot of times I think we go and we use these tools, uh, when we have found a vulnerability and we want to see the scale of the impact. Uh, I propose that you could, uh, well, I mean, what this demonstrates is like, there's a lot of untapped data out there. <clears throat> and they have an API. And so <clears throat> if like if you're wanting to get into IoT and uh, don't want to go spend $142 on a phone and then break it and then buy another one, which is completely understandable, uh one potential way to pick a target would be uh to use these APIs and you know structure a search that <clears throat> maybe you know searches for something like a bunch of 401s and then something unexpected or, you know, uh, if you know a particular request, you know, if you, the results for a certain uh, type of device are typically of a certain size, search for things that are outside that realm. Excuse me. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, this is kind of something like, I've just applied, so I've been doing computers professionally for 20 something years and you know, my whole life, I'm a geek at heart. I love it and I do it because I love it and I would be doing it even if I wasn't getting paid. And uh, I've noticed over the years, whether it's in selling hardware, software, networking or services, when you are invested in something uh, because you care about it and you know, you're not just like pushing stuff on people like the traditional salesperson uh, and just having fun, you know, money follows that and that it builds trust. So I would propose to people like, especially people who are trying to get into the industry and, and maybe see like, wow, look at all these people doing all this cool stuff, making all this money. This is so cool. I want to get me some of that. Uh, there's a whole lot behind the scenes that you're not seeing when you see that. And so it's very easy to get frustrated if you have like the wrong, uh, you know, you're focusing on the wrong thing. And so, uh, hack for fun and the profits will come. I, I truly believe that. 
And the only other thing on here that I want to point out is we really do need to praise these companies like Mitel. And, and uh, there was someone else this week who uh, gave a talk and he's like, you know, this company was spectacular. Um, I mean, that's not a, nothing. And really like you could put companies on like the, um, uh, oh my goodness, the grief scale, right? Like over here you have denial, over here you have acceptance. And 10 years ago, everyone was in denial. And if you went to them with it, they just preemptively sued you out of fear and, and denial. And, and there's still people there, still companies at that place. And then you have companies who are like, Hey, you know, come hack us. And, and if you write us a good report, we'll pay you, even if you don't find bugs because we care and we want our stuff to work right. Um, and you know, there's people everywhere in between. And while we, as, uh, you know, even if you're not in this for like bug bounties, but you're in it for, uh, whether it's just the good of the internet or uh, pen testing as a career, whatever it may be, there are some elements that are, are similar to like traditional uh, IT jobs where like you don't just walk into a company and be like, hey, you know, let's replace all your computers and, and Windows upgrade you to 2019 and all this, you know, exchange in the cloud tomorrow. You have to build a relationship and trust and understand them. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into that. And I think if you approach uh, this industry with that same attitude, we'll, we'll, we'll get to a place where we understand that like software vulnerabilities are going to happen. You, it doesn't matter like what uh, controls you have in place. Human beings are writing it and it is only human to make mistakes. And, and we don't want to like stigmatize it. Actually, I think we should praise the people who are doing it. And, and really where we're at right now is there's basically like a set of companies who are like subsidizing this, this burgeoning industry. And I realize it's, you know, it's quite a, several years old, but in the grand scheme of things, it's still pretty new. Um, and so we need to move these companies from over here to over here. And that's going to take time. And, uh, I can, I can think of, one scenario in my own experience uh, where I basically like I reported something to a company clearly was an impactful bug. They didn't see it that way. Uh, you know, I didn't, I was like, okay, cool. You know, that's cool. Um, yeah, I didn't push it. I haven't returned to their program since then, but I actually noticed like a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, um, you know, now they're doing things to try to attract researchers to their program. So what I think is happening there is like, they probably realize like, yeah, we're not getting much traffic. And, and so they're slowly moving over in this way. And, um, you know, it takes time. And if you're getting upset going off on Twitter or, you know, just being unprofessional, not only is that going to hurt you, but that's going to hurt the whole industry because I mean, you represent, this industry to those people. And, um, and that's, that can be dangerous for us all because really at the end of the day, we do need all this stuff to work. And, um, I mean, like the great firewall of America is now a topic of discussion. I mean, that, that's like a vote of no confidence in the internet. That's a concern. And, and we need to not let that happen. And, um, uh, Okay, so I'm uh, 15 over, so that's cool. Thanks for the extra time. Ping me afterwards if any of those numbers were yours. Thanks for your time. Happy DEF CON.